Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com and the associated websites, um, services, information, resources, and activities for the global medcoms community, by which I mean people who work in and around medical communications, uh, medical education, medical publishing, and, and so on. And, and indeed, importantly, for people who are interested in knowing more about medcoms and maybe starting a career in medcoms. Um, so these webinars are great. We can get people together um, talking about various topics. We've done a lot of them. Um, if you go to Network Pharma TV, you'll now find hundreds of videos, uh, many of which have come from webinars like this. Um, today, I'm, I'm, I'm really very interested in what we're doing today. We've got a, an extended webinar. Um, if you're watching this, there should be three panel sessions. You'll find them linked together on the videos. Um, but basically, we're going to start with uh, some individuals, the voice of the individuals within Medcoms. We're talking about um, how to succeed in Medcoms despite what life throws at you. Um, we're going to talk to the individuals. We've got some professionals coming. We've got some HR people from the companies coming later on. As I say, the videos will be linked in the in the blurb if you want to bounce around and have a look. Um, absolutely delighted to have you guys. Um, it's interesting times. We're at the end of December, uh, beginning of December, aren't we? Um, uh, 2021 is getting very interesting with COVID. But, you know, COVID has just highlighted lots of stuff that goes on in people's lives. Um, some of which is new, some of which has been there for a long time. Maybe we don't talk enough about it. So I'm hoping these discussions will just help people think a little bit about what we're doing, how people are getting on, how we support each other and so on. So on that note, I'm gonna sit back slightly and let Stephen uh, introduce this panel. Thanks, Stephen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, my name's Steve Walker from St. Giles Medical, uh, based in London and in Berlin. Uh, to those of you who got a mince pie, enjoy. To those of you who didn't, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Katja, who we're going to jointly chair this. Uh, Katja, would you like to say a few words? I would do. Um, I just, uh, from my point of view, in terms of introducing myself, I've had a split career. So the first part of my career was in medical communications and publishing. I'm now a performance coach and I do uh, job applications and interview. And for me, actually helping people to succeed wherever they are in their jobs is a really important um, factor for me. So I kind of jumped at the chance to be part of this webinar because I think particularly since the year that we've had or the couple of years that we've had, actually the more and more challenges that affect people. I'm particularly interested in um, late, mid and late career supporting people in that area because there are so many more challenges for them, particularly 40 to 60 year olds. Um, and, you know, in terms of throwing life, throwing things at us, one of the things it throws us at some of us is the menopause. And so that's why I've chosen to talk about that as part of my session today. And I think that's something that's really important in terms of when we're thinking about our working life and succeeding in our working life. So um, certainly afterwards, if anybody wants to have a chat to me about that, I'd be more than happy to, to share the little that I do know. Um, but I'm also joy I'm very happy to be joining this panel. Katya, thank you very much indeed. Um, so we all wear a mask and we all have a professional mask. Uh, we turn up at work, we look smart, we try and do our job. Um, but it's not really until you sort of get to know someone and you start to talk to them, do you realize all the difficulties they have behind that mask. It could be health wise, it could be with family, situations at home, it could be financial, all sorts of things. And these are things that may prevent you doing your job well, and they may also prevent you succeeding in your job. So today what we've done is we've, um, we're gonna concentrate on four speakers and two people who've shared various things offline. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, uh, gonna tell their story. Um, and I'm very grateful to, to, to all of you. So Katya, you're going to talk a little bit about what your problems that you've experienced. Um, Lisa Marie, very grateful for you coming on. It, it's a, a very topical problem that you're going to tell us about. Um, Mark, it's great to see you again, and again for being so courageous and honest to come and tell us about the issues that you face. And David, we've known each other for many years, and though your, your problem is well managed, um, it's good to hear about how you cope with things. Uh, and then as I said, two people have shared um, problems that they have with us. Um, one, he's not gonna talk because he's too shy and he's sitting opposite me. Uh, and the other person, because um, she has a, uh, when I read the piece that she wrote for me, 
uh, I was really heartbroken, actually, and um, I'm not surprised that she doesn't want to speak online. Uh, but we're very grateful for you all being with us today. Uh, we want people in the audience to, to reach out with questions and comments. Um, and then this will, uh, at the end of the second of this first session, we'll then talk to the professionals. We have um, uh, some comments from an HR consultant who couldn't join us today, but has given some written comments. Um, we have um, Jacques, uh, who is a, uh, a public health, uh, a, 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 um, a, an occupational health physician, who's going to, an author and eth ethicist, uh, who's going to talk about some issues. And hopefully Christina is going to join us from her practice in West London. So a very, very interesting session, but we'd like you to, to really interact with questions, thoughts, comments, your own experiences. Um, Anything else, Katja, that you'd like to say at this stage? No, day? said it perfectly. Um, Lisa Marie, can I put you on the spot? And um, very, very topical. Um, you look the picture of health sitting in front of us uh, with your Christmas decorations in the background. Um, but um, we'll probably guess what the problem is when you start coughing. But <laughs> yeah. tell us what's been happening to you. Um, yeah, um, hello, um, my name is Lisa Marie McLean and I work for Ashfield Medcoms, very new to the Medcoms industry previously, hospitality and events. Um, pre the last, I mean, well, I'm in week 60 right now. Um, I caught COVID back in October 2020 and um, started with um, just feeling a little bit flu like, achy, struggling with everything. And within a three to four hours, a genuine fear that I was going to die. It happened so fast. Um, my life completely changed in every single way, so shape and form. I have was one of the lucky ones, still, sometimes it's hard to say that because I don't really believe it, but I, I'm one of the lucky ones because I am still here. I was never ventilated, but I've had every single possible ailment that long COVID can throw up. Um, I started with the uh, rashes, not being able to breathe, my skin feeling like it was too tight on my body to cope with. One of the main things that I'm, I'm told by my doctor that she remembers me saying, because I have very little memory of the first three months, was that I felt like my skin was just too tight. I was like trying to rip my, pull my skin away from my chest because I just couldn't hack how tight everything felt. The pain of my entire body, my hair hurt, my fingernails hurt, I couldn't have rings on, um, I couldn't be touched. Um, everything was just terrifying. Nobody knew what was going on. Nobody could explain to me, <coughs> apologies, nobody could explain to me what was happening, why it was happening, what was gonna happen next, why the painkillers weren't working, why I was constantly being rushed into hospital, why I felt like I was on fire, yet my temperature was normal. Why my body was physically inflamed. I had, you can still see some swelling around here, yet when I have blood test results come back, there are no inflammation showing in my blood. And um, I have pain that I cannot describe or explain. And it took probably sort of 40, 50 weeks for me to just stop trying to find what was wrong stop trying to find something oh it's this it's not that and accept it's long covid nothing is going to fix this quickly i'm on currently 22 tablets a day i have been on 36 tablets a day just to function to keep awake to fall asleep to numb this pain to help everything it's been the hardest 60 60 weeks of my life um my blood oxygen at times has reached 77 um, I, luckily, that was whilst in hospital because that was an absolutely terrifying moment. My heart, my resting heartbeat, are currently right now it is at, I'm a bit nervous, so it's 141, but my resting heart rate is a minimum of 121. Diagnosed, diagnosed as tach tachycardic, um, um, sinus tachycardic, then back to tachycardic. I'm under cardiologist at present who's trying to look into it, and I'm due results of a 24 hour ECG tomorrow. Um, I'm finding I'm clumsy. I can't remember anything. You should see how many notes I've got in front of me so I don't forget very, very key points. Memory is underlined and circled about 17 times because I just can't remember anything. It's just been horrific. Um, the support I've had from work, from I know you're going to go into that slightly um, shortly, the support I've had from friends, family and the NHS has been 
unbelievable. I have been the luckiest person I know with this illness by just seeing what other people are going through. It took from the end of November when my doctor diagnosed me as having long COVID whilst I was crying in the bath to the 18th of March. So three months to get to the long COVID support post COVID group. Um, and then my journey began with them. Um, within two weeks, I'd seen a long COVID specialist, respiratory physicist, fatigue management. I have access to a living with app that helps me daily with how to cope with mental issues, how to cope with the fact that I can't stop crying today, how to cope with the big taboo subject of, of depression, why I am depressed, I didn't want to take um, antidepressants, what did in the end, and the difference has been amazing, and I'm so glad I did take that step, that very hard step to help me get better. And I'm just in the most incredible care with our NHS as possible. Surprisingly to all of you, I bet this will be, um, I am one week into being diagnosed with COVID again last week. Sorry. On the um, 6th of December, I had a positive COVID, again, a positive result, which just sent sheer terror through my entire body. I never thought I could ever get this again. Um, and for the first time today, I can taste. For the first time today, I don't want to cry. And I just feel if I hadn't have been vaccinated the first time round, so if I hadn't have been vaccinated, this would be a different kettle of fish. If I had have been vaccinated at the start of all this, I don't feel I would have had half the ailments I've had now. I've wobbled on for so much now, I'm going to stop. But I would explain, I would say that I am as much of a long COVID specialist as you can be. Um, I'm supporting quite a few people on many long COVID support groups. And I feel I got this illness to be able to help people going forward. Lisa Murray, that, that is a, a horrendous story, and you've probably seen some of the comments appearing in the chat box, and that's very, very honest of you to, to tell us about all these things. I mean, just thinking about work, so you, you haven't long been with Ashfield. No. What, what normally is your role? What would you normally be doing today? <laughs> so my role is, um, I was taken on as an agency assistant, um, so basically supporting everybody in my in the Phoenix unit. So it could be things like arranging travel um, back in the days when we travelled um, to organising lunches to basically financially supporting on on projects, on budgets and pulling as much information together as I possibly can. And during the last 60 weeks, have you been able to do any work at all? Yeah, so I, I've tried to go back three times. I successfully managed it in um, in July. Um, after nine full months off, um, day one was pretty, pretty terrible. Couldn't remember anything. Got myself incredibly worked up and ended up speaking to my doctor and taking the rest of that week to just deal with everything. Um, but I got myself up to pre the early um, December. I was back to doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, five days, five hours a day. Um, sometimes I'd need a break, sometimes I couldn't do that, but I have found building myself up from two hours to three hours to four hours, um, and the next stage will be to get the second day in so I can do aim to do a full week, and work have been incredibly supportive in helping me and allowing me um, to re recover and return slowly. I mean, it is a, a credit to, to Ashfield that they have oh. supported you in this way. And it's also good to hear that you're now in the COVID clinic, long COVID yeah. clinic. Is there anything sort of missing on your journey that would have helped? Genuinely, the only thing I can say would be, in hindsight, which is delightful, um, is to have had someone to tell me that it's going to get better. To have somebody to tell me, in time, you will be able to get to this level. You will be able to get out of bed. You will be able to open an Excel spreadsheet and remember how to do something and format something just to have someone to talk to and listen to and vent to, but also knowing there's nothing scarier than financial worry and not being able to do your job properly. Being, I'm almost 40 and I feel like I'm back to square one of my career again because I've lost all this time. It would have been to be told that everything will be okay. You can get through this. There are people out there who are, are survivors, people who've had long COVID longer than I have and who have had it less than I have. And just knowing that there is support out there and ask for help. I'm a terrible person for asking. I always want to try my best to do it myself. Just um, so final question 
from me at this stage. Um, practically with Ashfield, how do you do it? Do you speak to them every week and give them an update or how does it work? So well, with myself from pretty much day one, I got the call that I had been in contact with somebody with COVID at work and contacted my, my line manager immediately, went for my test, was in contact. It had to be via text because I could not do anything else or function any other way. And so it was literally by message. And then I got really poorly and my husband was speaking to work and sending emails in on my behalf. Then it came to weekly updates that I wanted to do. And I was so keen to get back to work. My doctors wanted to sign me off longer. And I was like, no, can we just do two weeks and review it? And um, so it was initially line manager, HR. I was in contact with our um, business unit headlock because I just found everyone so human if that makes sense everybody's I felt like I not felt like I'm, I'm at the bottom of the rung in the ladder within Ashfield in my personal opinion and I felt I was getting support and people really valued me and it was just fantastic I felt I feel like if I hadn't have had that this again could have been a completely different story so just contacting email face a couple of facetimes which are very difficult in zoom and um, but mainly at the start all in writing because I couldn't talk um Katja, is there anything else that you'd like to ask at this stage, or can I pass the microphone over to you? Yeah, yeah no, definitely. Oh, well, just amazing and, and, and horrifying at the same time. Um, but I think interesting your comment about uh, the episode of once you got to um, support groups and then your help of other people and yeah. how much that helped you in terms of yeah. almost giving you a bit of control over something you don't have control over. Um, and I suspect that Perfect. might be a theme actually within all the, the, the calls, this idea that, you know, there's lots of things that can happen. But at the minute you just have even just a slight bit of control, it doesn't check, it doesn't get rid of it. But it mm. just might take that step where, you know, you actually can manage something in a way that you couldn't before, that you wouldn't have been exactly. able to before. Amazing. It's, it was with me, it was a case of where I was like, right, maybe there is a reason why I got this so I can help this person to get to this step. And I have been doing that. And it is, it's a purpose and to be feel valued because it's just I just want everybody to not if I can help one person not go through what I've gone through, then that's yeah. problem solved. Yeah. And, and, and it does seem to me that it's you know, not just you know, it's not just one place or one person. It's it, there's a multi multi factored uh, approach there oh. is no one solution no nope. and it's building that picture up bit by bit by bit yeah. and being patient and accepting that's what I've had to do I've had to accept this is me now this won't be me forever this might be me for the next few weeks and that was the hardest thing to do once yeah. I got that nailed everything slowly fell slowly into into the sort of the bright lines thank um, you so, so thank you so much for that thank um, you Stephen. Katia, um, over to you for now. I think you're going to be talking to Mark. To Mark, yes, Mark. I'll, I'll um, get, wait till you've cleared. That's lovely. Well, for, um, I think Mark, you, you you bring a completely different perspective. You you bring a condition that you've been living with. Um, you have um, autism, and um, that is the part of the story that would be lovely to hear from you from your perspectives. Um, you know, it'd be really interesting if you could take a few minutes to talk about maybe some of the challenges you faced working um, and particularly how things have changed over time and particularly with um, the changes that we've been all forced to make through COVID. Yes, so I, I'm Mark, I'm a freelance writer and I'm autistic. Uh, as well as being a freelance writer though, I've worked in the civil service in an office policy job for over 30 years. Uh, and aspects of that have been very hard. Um, I've always been okay at what I call doing the proper work, as in written work, computer work, and so on. But as soon as other people become involved, talking to other people, meetings, things like that, it has always been a struggle. And the other thing I've always struggled with is, is, is noise, and particularly with, with hearing voices. Now, I, I, the best comparison I can make is if I'm in a room and, and there's 30, or 40 people talking if you're at a party or a big event or something uh, most people as i understand it you can sort of block it out and just focus on the one person that you're listening to i for some reason to do with autism i'm completely unable to do that if i can hear 30 voices at once i am trying to understand and follow all 30 conversations which 
tends to lead to my brain quickly getting overloaded, uh, becomes almost painful, and I, I certainly can't function in any meaningful way. And so these problems with, with the noise and with meetings and, and interpersonal skills and so on had followed me all my career until about five years ago, when after much prompting from both people at work and, and people outside of work in my family, I was able to be diagnosed with, with autism. And by the time the diagnosis came, I was pretty sure that was the case anyway. Uh, but it changed everything because it explained everything. Mm. Um, it didn't change who I was, but it meant that there was a reason why I was different. There was a reason why I experienced things in a different way to how I saw that other people experienced things for, for a long time. It didn't even occur to me that, that everybody else didn't try and follow 30 conversations at once yeah. and then find their head was exploding. But but suddenly right, I realised, no, I was different. I wasn't better or worse than anybody else. I was just different. My brain was wired a different way. And, and once I became autistic and sort of joined the autism community, more and more aspects of my life clicked into place. And I, I, I found out we're actually well known to be connected to autism and to neurodivergence and so on. So, as I say, work has been difficult because, like many places, my, my office, the office has always been open plan. And as soon as you get an open plan office with about more than about four or five people in it, there's always at least one person with a hugely loud voice that seems to feel the need to, to speak all day. Uh, and that's always difficult. So I've really struggled with noise and, and, and things like that. And I've always found meetings incredibly difficult because of the interactions with other people. I, I find any kind of face to face interactions. Uh, very difficult. I struggle with reading body language, with making eye contact, with understanding tone of voice and things like that, all, all of which are, are quite typical for, for many, but not all autistic people. And then, of course, last March, everything completely changed. And we went overnight from working full time in the office to working full time at home which completely changed my work environment. Now, I, I never really liked working at home before then, but it, it quickly became apparent this wasn't just going to be for a week or two, this was going to be long term. So I, I did what many people had did and, and, and went from sitting with the laptop on my lap in the living room to work to actually, no, I need to sort out the spare bedroom and, and make a, a proper office for myself. And once I've done that, I've, I've never looked back because I absolutely love it. And it is all about the element of control that, that mm. we talked to Lisa and Maria about earlier. I can control my environment here. If I want some soothing music on, I put soothing music on. If I just want quiet, I can have quiet. I haven't got to think, will noise cancelling headphones work or whatever? I'm not going to be interrupted by somebody shouting down the phone across the office and so on. I can set things up exactly as I want them to be. I can take breaks when I need to take breaks and so on. And it's been really empowering. And I, I, the last 18 months have probably been the most productive 18 months of my whole working career. Wow. Simply because the environment has changed so much. Now, meetings was an interesting one. As I said, I, I struggle with them. And one thing that happened when we all went to working from home was that there seemed to be even more meetings then. They were just all over teams um, yeah. because people were desperate to stay in touch. And, and I get that. But I, I quickly realised I was just not going to be able to keep this up. And I, I now know that if I do more than about two and a half to three hours of, of Teams calls in a day, that will wipe me out for the rest of the day. So I, I was I was going to ask that, that actually is, you know, there's some element of control, uh, taking things offline and not being in a busy group of people. But actually, is it also completely overload, this idea of having to do all your interactions um, on the computer when you've got the faces and voices that don't quite match and you're trying to follow disparate conversations does that make it harder in some way it, it can make it harder there's, there's pluses and minuses to it i mean it, it can be harder I, I like it in that you can always tell who's speaking and, and and so on which isn't wasn't always the case if you had just a, a voice call with lots of people on it and mm. so on and I'm very careful as to how many calls I will take. And, and the people on my team that I work with know that I can't do endless meetings all day, every day, as, as some people seem to do. Um, they know that if they want to communicate with me, I'm much happier doing sort of instant messaging by text and so on, rather than speaking on the phone. Sometimes you speak on the phone, that's fine. But a lot of our day-to-day -day business, we just ping messages backwards and forwards on, on chat functions, which works a lot better for me and so on. And, it, and again, it's, it's down to that element of control. And if I have to be in a meeting on Teams, 
it does at least mean if, if you get to a long chunk of the meeting that I'm finding difficult, I can go away and look things up myself and so on, or, or, or check what's happening. Yeah. I haven't, it, it's not that pressure to sit in a room and look totally engaged the whole time, which yeah. I really struggle to do, even if I am interested and engaged. I, I, I know that I will sometimes not look, not appear that way, because again, I, I, I don't really get body language either in myself or in other people. And, and just thinking about the sort of discussions with the employer, you know, have there been discussions? Is this just more informal things where, you know, as you've gone along, you've made agreements with actually, you know, this is easier for me and that's, you know, making this sort of adjustment is easier for me. Absolutely. And all, all my sort of immediate managers, and I've had a few since I got my diagnosis, have been fantastic and kind of all thankfully viewed it as a learning opportunity for them to learn about neurodivergence and about autism mm. and, I, and I've been asked to do a number of talks at work about autism to, to increase awareness because I think education is key and that autism is hugely misunderstood and, and that people have this sort of stereotypical view of autism as, as it's a naughty five-year-old having a tantrum in a supermarket kind of thing and, that, and that's not what it is at all. Autistic children grow up into the autistic adults about one in a hundred people are autistic so we're everywhere uh, and, and people want to learn and want to understand and autism is very often not what they expect and so once I've explained to my managers well this is as it affects me but if you have another autistic member of staff they may be very different from me mm. and they've been very good to, to accommodate me as far as they can and, and, and yeah. recognize too that it, it brings as many strengths as weaknesses and, and issues to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. So what are the sorts of changes that from, from your point of view, almost that, you know, they may have come by accident, but what do you think for the future? What's the, what are the things that you think would actually make life much easier for the future? Well, it, I think it's helped a lot of people with, with impairments or disabilities to work from home. It, it gives us much more control over our environment. We're much more productive. What, what I am dreading is, is having all of that thrown away in a rush that mm. we must get back to exactly how things were before, because mm. there are a lot of advantages for this. I know some people are desperate to get back to the office for a whole range of reasons, and that's completely fine. And, and I fully support them in doing that. But messages that come out that being back at the office is better for everybody, it just isn't true because it really isn't for some isn't, of us. Yeah. And, and it, what, like many autistic people, I struggle with change. And for 30 years, I've had managers, senior managers bringing in new schemes, new ways of working, and we're constantly told to embrace change, change is good. Suddenly there's been a big change that wasn't brought in by senior managers that was forced <laughs> on us all. And now suddenly, no, ch change wasn't that great. We need to go back to how we were. Well, no, this has brought a lot of positives. Obviously there's been some huge negatives as, as Lisa Marie, has experienced and so on but the positives that some of us have now from being able to control our environment to be much more productive I really hope aren't thrown away mm. in a massive drive to get back to things exactly as they were before last March because things are never going to be like they were before yeah, last before March, last March. So, so, so let's at least try and keep as many of the good bits as we can from how we've changed. Brilliant. Stephen did you have anything to to add to that, I mean, it's um, quite a compelling story. Absolutely. Uh, uh, all I can just say is, is that, you know, great courage, Mark, for you to open up and tell these people, tell people about this, and this must help. Um, I didn't know so much about autism, um, and, and you, you know, you bring the whole subject to life. So no particular comments at this stage. Lovely. Thank you. That's great. Um, so. Mark, we'll let you go for now. Join us later on if you can, or if you have to peel off, by all means. We're, we're very, very grateful for your input, and it's lovely to see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so, um, Katja, you, you change your role now from being the sort of uh, uh, interviewer to, do, to being the sort of an interviewee. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, it, it, it all, this whole session really started with you, didn't it, really? You and Peter um, talking about issues, and um, uh, your story is all around menopause. Uh, it's something as a sort of, as a guy, okay, even as a, even as a sort of medic, um, I never really sort of thought about it. Uh, in medcoms, it's, it's what, um, Peter will probably correct me if I'm wrong, it's sort of 75% women. Um, sometimes as a guy, uh, I feel a bit in minority. Um, but uh, so, you know, thinks about, uh, one thinks about, I never thought that menopause was such an issue. 
So I wonder if I could ask you to tell us your story, please. Well, I will. I mean, as I said, though, the reason why um, I think it's so important to include menopause in this and, and raise awareness and part of telling the story and actually saying the word menopause in a professional setting, which kind of gets stuck here quite often, but you have to say it, is because it's so important for, I think, for women and their career progression. And I think, you know, you, you do see stories and you do, do see headlines about um, the number of women who resign from their work, who retire early from their work because of menopause. So it's not necessarily that I'm going to describe all of those situations for me, but I think it's important to raise it and for other women in uh, medcoms to be thinking about menopause as part of their career planning. And I think my journey with menopause, I would best described best describe it as unaware, uninformed and unprepared, and which is the worst possible uh, uh, scenario. Um, and, but un, un, unaware in that completely clueless that menopause was anything other than a bit of uh, hot flushes. You, you know, they hear the stories of the, the hot flush um, and that, you know, of course, it's a natural transition. It's not a medical condition and the idea that you just carry on. But actually being in the state of postmenopausal it lasts for your life. So if there are symptoms or changes that happen because of the lack of these hormones, they potentially are with you for all your life. Um, the most, I think the most obvious, I'm about just over a year, I think, postmenopausal. Um, the most obvious and long lasting have been uh, for me, the, the hot flushes. You think, well, that can't be that bad, but they really, they are quite troubling in terms of um, a kind of simple symptom that just interferes with your daily life. And in, for me, increasing menopause for quite a few years now to the point where I have maybe four to six a month. So they, it interferes with their daily activities. But actually, if you look at the, the whole picture of the sorts of changes and the symptoms that women can have, they can range from, uh, range from anxiety, depression, joint pain, hair loss, uh, memory loss. Some women report they think they have early onset dementia and it's the menopause can be quite alarming. Um, urinary tract infections, osteoporosis, and then things like the change to the weight and your shape. So all it can affect all aspects of a woman's life, which interferes with, with working. Um, I think most shocking for me was the idea that these changes actually start happening probably seven to 10 years before you actually reach menopause. So you've potentially got this buildup of changes that are happening to you that if you are unaware of, it basically creeps up on you. Um, some happen, some of the changes happen rapidly, uh, weight gain, changing shape, face changes shape. Sounds like vanity, but actually, if in a short period of time, how you look changes, it affects your self-image, self-confidence, all aspects of you. you. You lose who you are because you, you change more than you have ever done before. Um, and some of the, I think some of the changes really creep up on you to the point where probably be really difficult now to say, you know, my ability, to, my capacity to deal with multiple problems, as you know, it's a very important work skill. Has that changed? Am I really able to do that? Is it just age or is this um, a symptom of menopause? Very difficult. If you're not aware, it's very difficult to tease out. Um, actually what's going on and it can kind of leave you it can it can affect your confidence and and means that you don't deal with things as well as you could do um, and then uninformed about things like uh, the fact that you you're meant to during this time look after your future health so this isn't just immediately dealing with symptoms this is actually thinking about the future health like uh, osteoporosis mental health uh, in the long term and even the solutions like um, whether you could take HRT for, for many, many years, because I had migraines, I didn't think I could take HRT. And of course, with the menopause, I was getting more migraines. But actually, you can take some forms of HRT with migraines, and I didn't know that. So again, I'm not making changes and perhaps didn't do things that I could have done earlier on that might have changed what I've gone through. And so that sort of takes me to the being unprepared. Um, I think one of the things I was unprepared for was that actually you don't just get menopause. 
menopause happens when other, you know, when life's throwing things at us, it doesn't just throw the menopause. In my case, it was the menopause. My story is like menopause, migraines and mum. So during that same period of time as my menopause was symptoms and my migraines were getting worse, I then had some health issues with my mum that I had to deal with. And everybody has all these complexities. So it's not unusual. But I think when you don't realise what the pieces of the complexity are, it becomes very difficult to then deal with them. So I was completely oblivious to the menopause side of things. So then you're perhaps not looking for the right sorts of solutions. And, and uh, I think uh, Lisa Marie made the point about not asking for help. I think the difficulty is when you're oblivious to what's going on, you can't ask for help because you can't ask for something that you don't know about. And so then it makes it very difficult for other people to help you as well. Um, and this is why I wanted to sort of bring in this story today um, in amongst all these other stories and really getting people to think about menopause as part of their career progression and as part of their career planning. Because I actually think it's an element that for most of us, again, it'd be really interesting to hear from the audience whether they were prepared, but it's an element that we, we are missing. I think most of us are missing from our career planning and it's a so it's not just one, one year. I kind of had this idea that you've got flushes for a year. It's potentially could be over 10 years, a decade worth of planning, which affects your career. Make decisions if you don't know about them. Stephen, you've got your... For, for a guy, this is a um, really insightful. This is the things I... And as I said beforehand, one knows about periods and but menopause is something one does not think about. Um, uh, one of our friends, uh, you know, anticipated old age and disability and built a lift in the house, which was very forward thinking. But to think in, in your career that this is going to be something that affects you, um, that, is, that is a new insight. I've not hear, heard that. If I just interrupt you, the problem for, for women particularly is that for many of them, they've already... They've planned around, let's say, those who have families. So there's already an element of their career that they've had to put aside time uh, in terms of getting promotions and getting the better job, in terms of getting the better career. And, you know, you had to plan that around. And it's very easy to think, oh, you know, get to your 40s, that's all out of the way, the family is growing up. Um, but actually there is this other phase that potentially could start from the 40s which could then also equally affect career, career progression. Uh, if you're having memory problems and you suddenly can't remember deadlines, it's immediately impacting your work. You might feel that it's just you. It might, you might feel it's age. You might feel that I'm not as good as I was. I'm not as driven as I was. And potentially these are all um, symptoms of menopause. If we're not ready for them, then we, we try and battle through without looking at where the, the real solutions are. How long was the journey from, you know, thinking about something's wrong with me to actually a diagnosis being made and then getting treatment? It's a supplementary question, getting treatment. Has the treatment, the, the, the answer sounds like no, but has the treatment cured the problem or, you know, have your symptoms largely gone yeah. away? Uh, it's, I'm very early in, in the stage now, so I've only, um, I, within a month, I've only been taking HRT for a month. Almost all my flushes have stopped. I don't yet have more migraines. It'll be interesting to see what it does with that. Whether it changes anything else, I think, is a longer journey. And I think just as um, you kind of don't realise what's changed, I think slowly, if HRT is going to change it back I think it will take some time the journey took me 10 years and seven months the seven months was from the point where I watched the Davina McCall documentary and my eyes nearly fell out of my head because I suddenly realized how clueless I'd been this was back in May and the 10 years was probably the 10 years I suffered it and had no idea I was suffering it but it did take a good seven months for me to six months or seven months to pick up the courage to do the research, to decide what HRT I wanted, um, and then just go to the doctor and say, these are my symptoms, I want H HRT. Um, but that was um, quite surprising how much 
I just assumed that I would be given something if I needed it. But actually it's the opposite. As a, as a woman with menopause, you have to do your research, go in and tell the doctor what you want. And that's how you get to the next stage. And it's trial and error. I'm In a, three months time, I might be saying it doesn't work for me, but at least I've tried it and I've looked to see what the, what the options are. Gotcha. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Certainly. Let this run on a little bit uh, because I've just had a message here from Christina. Crisis, have suicidal patient, and likely I can join. So okay. let's see how we do there. Um, final question from me um, is, has this held you back? It's difficult to know. And that part of the, when you're thinking about this, part of it is then starting to run back over 10 years and think, what decisions was I making? It's complicated with other things like um, caring needs. So other factors are involved. It's all, the difficulty is it's so complicated. What I'm upset at and what I would have liked to have, you know, if I could turn back time, is early on when I was having the migraines, uh, reflux, tiredness, is to have been having those sorts of discussions or those thoughts about whether it could be the menopause and perhaps doing things earlier, maybe 10 years, we're talking 10 years, a decade, and thinking about whether I would have been a different person sitting here today if I'd been doing something different 10 years ago. So that I think that's the, that's the story that it's always, it's in the sliding doors, it's impossible to go back and say how I could have been a different person. But I think definitely um, earlier, thinking about this, you know, it's inconceivable that you should be thinking about this in your 30s and 40s. But that is the reality, is that's when we should be thinking about this and potentially it changes the future trajectory of what we do and the decisions we make as well. Gotcha. Let's leave that for now. So thank you Certainly. again for being very open and, and painting a, a very good picture uh, of uh, something, as I said, most of the male race certainly do not, uh, do not know about. Um, I'm afraid you're not let off the hook because it's over to you now, because you are going to talk to uh, my friend David. To David, um, yes. And, um, about something that may not seem so dramatic um, and possibly simply because David has managed it so well. So, so Kaja, over to you. Exactly, and, and I think David, it's really lovely having you on the panel uh, because you do provide uh, a very different perspective. Somebody who has um, a lifelong condition, you, have, you manage diabetes, but actually somebody who from our earlier exchanges, you seem very much in control of that, that you manage it. And you've said earlier that, you know, it doesn't affect your work or, or what you do. So it would be really lovely to hear your experience of um, managing that condition within the workplace. Hello, yes. Um, thank you for having me on. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been type one diabetic for, for 55 years. I was diagnosed at the age of seven. Um, I've been in medcoms, um, most of my life now, really, my working life, um, uh, from observing scientific posters being done um, in the uh, uh, early days um, by a, a company in Macclesfield called PPS, who, who the, 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 the person in charge there went on to, to, to launch GCC, it's is now Ashfield. Uh, I worked at Ashfield uh, for a few years myself, and in those days, I was on a, a much milder kind of insulin. Um, I mean, I started off on ox-based insulin, pig-based insulin. It was a one injection a day, but I don't think it was giving me very good control of my blood sugars. But it was, in those days, I was just so full of energy that it didn't seem to bother me anyway. But when I was at GCC, um, the, uh, on, on the odd occasion that I'd, my blood sugar would get too low for me to realise what was going on, I recall the next day, people, one or two people would say, if we, were, if I was working late, as we all know, we, we have to work late in this, in this kind of in this business. Um, they say you were wandering around the corridors last night, Dave, and you looked odd. You didn't seem right. Um, now they knew I was diabetic, but they they weren't so sure um, 
uh, as to whether it was my diabetes or I was just acting a bit strangely, really. But it was my my, my low blood sugar, where 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 you 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 just can't get a grip of what you're trying to think about, and you start to concentrate. And the more you concentrate, the more you're putting off eating some food or taking some sugar, uh, and the worse it gets. But it, it, in those days, it took a long time. But but these days, um, as I've moved on. Uh, uh, I, I'm on a, a much more aggressive kind of insulin, man-made insulin, rapid acting stuff. And you've got to be, you've got to be, you've got to be on the ball with it because it can take you, um, it, it, you can be totally unaware. It'll, it'll get you. And if you ignore it for too long, the next thing you, you find is that you're on, you're on the deck, you've, mm -hmm. you've hit the floor and somebody's phoned for an ambulance and the paramedics are there. Um, uh, I know that um, not that many years ago, I had an incident where I was working um, with a colleague of mine. We, we, we both were freelancers working in a, uh, a, a studio in a big office block. And um, I was working late, uh, again, as, as, you, as, as you know, is, is often the case with this. And um, it was maybe 10 o'clock at night and my wife hadn't heard from me. And in the meantime, I'd collapsed in a locked room um, and they had to beat the door down to 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 get the paramedics in. And eventually, I, I came round and they they they, they got me back. Um, but 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 this has been um, few and far between, really. I think mm. I think it generally tends to hit me uh, and the family more so um, when 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 I'm relaxed and on holiday. Those kind of situations where and, and I have to say that unfortunately for myself I, and my family. I've found myself in these situations where I've woke up in hospitals in various different countries on holiday. Um, I recall in one, one case, I, I collapsed up, a, up, a, up a, a volcano on my own, but the people there had been good enough to get, get, get my phone off me, check the numbers, get me, yeah, make the calls, and I, I woke up in hospital. Um, but I go into these seizures sometimes when it's very bad, and I just call it fighting for my life. I, I end up biting my tongue, um, and, and and for the next few days afterwards, sometimes I can hardly walk because I've been that tensed up with the with the uh, with, with, with these seizures. Um, I recall one nurse said to me once, "You were close to God." Mm, um, goodness, but, I mean that's quite dramatic. I know, yeah, and it does make you think. I mean. That, that, that thought that thought is appealing in one way but 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 not any other uh, no. but, but I also find that that, that sometimes it's much, as good as as good as the people that, that are there to help me in 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 the, in the NHS and, and and places around the world who in similar situations you know you you find that some people just don't really understand it or get it it's like when I'm watching a film and somebody's on, on in the film is a diabetic and they get it all the wrong way around and I think they need an advisor because this isn't what happens. The reality. Uh, on, yeah, and on one occasion, I, I again, it was I think it was in Lanzarote. They um, on another occasion there, we, we go there a lot. Um, uh, somebody was changing a bag of something that was being on a drip to me, and I said, "What's that you're changing?" She said, "I'm giving you some more glucose." And I said, "Well, I don't think I need any because they always want me to have glucose. They always want me to eat." And you have to sometimes uh, take a step out and say, no, 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 let me check my blood, yeah. my glucose. So she said, look, I'm the doctor. And I said, no, let me check my glucose. And I checked my glucose. It was up at 27 instead of at the norm of, of about five. And so she realized, so you do have to, I have, I have to fight in those situations far more than I've ever had to fight yeah. in, in a workplace. In the workplace, all my employers over the years have been very good, but as I say, when I'm when I'm focused, I'm I'm more aware of the fact that I've got to make sure I've got my my sweets or my digestive biscuits there yep. or something nice. Like like you had to plan like you had to plan today just for this call. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yes. What, and, David, and, can I, and, David, sorry, can I ask you the sort of the advice you'd give to somebody? Um, maybe they've been newly diagnosed or they've got a condition in terms of the actual workplace, if we, th if we th think about this in terms of succeeding in a workplace setting, what advice would you give, you know, that they, 
talk to the HR if they worry about, you know, I don't want to admit to a weak, you know, having a weakness or an illness. Yeah. Do you say that actually really they need to speak to their employers think, and get that support? I think they need to obviously make them aware. But again, it's down to the control um, and it, some diabetics that you, you, you hear, I hear some people talk about, oh, my blood sugars are all over the place. Uh, they, they, they don't have a grip on it. And, and, and I asked them, what is your blood sugar? I, I was sitting on a train a few years ago and there was a young girl on the other side of the aisle and I could see she checked her blood, her, her blood and I said, is it all right? And she looked at me, you know, like, who are you? And, I, and she said, yes, it's this. And, my, and she said, my doctor's told me to keep my blood sugar up here. And I said, I've said, well, that, 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 seems, that seems strange because that's so far above normal. And, and I found that um, GPs and, and specialists, diabetic specialists, would rather I keep my blood sugar up above normal. And I think it's really just a question that they're, they don't want to feel that there's any responsibility that they've misadvised me uh, mm. to try and keep my blood sugar on the straight and narrow. It, it is a little bit like walking along a knife edge because you could fall you. either way. Um, but but the, the great thing is um, with, the, with the new technology, um, and I'm using an Abbott Freestyle Libra, um, which is, is, is very simple to use. You just basically have a thing that I pop on my arm and I can just check my blood sugar it's a little bit high at the minute, but I, I did have a few uh, biscuits before we started. Keep so going. I need to take a corrective dose now. And it's all about the, that kind of understanding and, and, and how to control it and getting yeah. used to how you're responding to just two units or, or a, a fig or something. You know, it could be that simple. Yeah, definitely. But Stephen, is that um, in terms of how we're doing with time and how we're managing this session? <laughs> I think we probably need to draw this one to a close, really. Um, but David, uh, as I've known you for a few years now, I didn't realise all this stuff. And, uh, and, and you know, credit to you the way you, you manage all this. Um, so I've no, I have no further questions for you at this stage. OK. Um, so Brilliant. as we sort of approach the hour, we're, we're sort of 10 minutes over. Um, I'm going to share two things with you. Um, so my colleague, who is here in the office with me at the moment, uh, young Daniel, who looks after our, our office, he's our office manager, looks after our finances and many, many little jobs that he does, which we couldn't manage without. Um, and he has been plagued his whole life by migraines since the age of six. He runs in the family, his mum and his grandmother, uh, both of them um, seem to have grown out of it. He hasn't done that yet. Um, on the St. Giles Medical website, and we have a sort of uh, section where you can read various articles that we've written and lots of personal stuff, educational stuff. And he's written two very interesting little articles about living with migraine, tips for self-management. Um, but he, um, he does a great job, but he, as an employer, one needs to be aware of this problem and not, uh, and just live with it. So he, he may be working away doing a great job, doing the accounts, helping with tables, figures, God knows what else. Um, and then suddenly he disappears. And that's because he's had a sudden um, walk around for a little bit or go home and lie down, and he comes back in a few hours. This is really changed. And it may be that some employers may find um, here it's perfect. The central line, you need to get in the taxi, you can easily get home. You can easily come back to the office quickly. But this is, you know, this has changed his life. Uh, you'll see that in the, if you do read his article, um, you'll see that he, um, you know, gives some advice about, um, he's found exercise particularly good. That seems to shorten the length of time that he needs to lie down. Uh, but this is a young man who's very talented, whose life has been ruined by migraines. I just thought it wasn't a particularly serious disease. I thought the modern tablets could treat it. I thought it was, a, 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 for some reason or other, a, a, a problem that affected girls. Sorry about that. Um, and but this is this is very very unfair. Um, but hopefully he will you know live. He does lots of things. He's got a motorbike license now. Um, his parents don't know about it, but they probably will know about it now. Um, he is uh, an amazing guy. But his life is you know he's tried every single treatment there is, uh, including I don't know dietary things, acupuncture, you name it. Every new that comes out. 
but this is something that we need to live with. It's, uh, I think, the third most common chronic disease, um, and he's living with it very, very well. So he's a little bit shy and didn't want to come on, uh, but be kind to people who've got migraines. The final thing I'm going to raise is um, a problem of ethnic diversity, basically racialism. So we have an associate who is a talented um, MSc pharmacist. Uh, she is uh, an asylum seeker. She's Muslim. Uh, she comes from a country in Africa. Um, and we are trying to um, give her work experience and we hope we can help her career. But since coming to the UK, um, many people have helped her, but some people have been mean to her because um, she uh, wears the uh, you know, appropriate um, clothing for a Muslim woman, uh, modesty. Um, uh, and um, you have to get used to the fact that she looks different. She goes off regularly to pray um, and um, you wonder where she's disappeared to, um, but she's doing great, great work. And people, uh, I'm, I'm particularly horrible to, I, I thought London was a very diverse place and that we were used to all these people from different countries and we made them welcome. Uh, but her story, uh, she wrote it down for me, it's too awful to actually read out, but we need to think about people from um, ethnic and diverse countries and, and groups, racial groups, and we need to support them as best we can really. So, so what I get from this whole session is the diversity of problems that people have. And it's a business about the mask. We all have this mask on and, and it may not just be, as Katya properly said, it may not just be one problem, it may be a whole range of problems. And um, I'm just reading out some of the, the sort of comments here that they're doing in the chat. And um, it, it may be that you want to comment on these now, or we can bring it up later on. Um, so Helen mentioned about the problems of menopause and the mood swings and how it's affecting her work, dealing with people in situations. Um, uh, uh, Rihanna makes a point that um, menopause is happening at a time when, uh, again, Katya, you mentioned this, when, when other difficult things are happening in your life. You might have teenage children, elderly parents, and you have to cope with those. That's not easy. Um, Tom makes support the comment about autism um, and uh, the issue about misdiagnosing eating disorders. Uh, and there, there's so many comments, Mark, um, uh, Lisa, um, Katya, about you, know, you raising very difficult issues and, um, and making us aware about it. Um, also post-pregnancy changes. Um, there are a couple of questions which I'll perhaps leave till the next session. Um, uh, but for now, I think, um, Peter, I'd like to close the session for now uh, and then we'll go over to, um, to, to, to Jacques uh, and we'll probably spin out that session a little bit longer if that's okay with you. If I could just say one thing, I, I saw a couple, in a couple of the comments, there's one comment where somebody was asking me um, uh, for, uh, some thoughts and I probably don't have time to do it now, but I, I, uh, Eva, I think that's you. Um, anybody can just email me if, I, if we've got our, uh, or via LinkedIn, I'll be more than happy to have a, a chat to anybody, but I just, I'm, I'm not going to, if I start typing comments, I'm not going to be concentrating on everything that's um, being said here. So, so the Eva's question, uh, uh, just for everyone, is a practical advice of how to prepare. Uh, there's another interesting question. Um, uh, uh, um, Lisa Marie, you might want to think about this. And um, Tamara's asking about uh, COVID versus other chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are there any unique characteristics of COVID as opposed to other chronic diseases? So if you're able to stay for the second half, we can possibly bring you back on that one. Um, also, Michael's asking about migraines and the value. Uh, this is something again later on for you, um, Katia, about you know, soya, nutrition, vitamin B, evening primrose oil. Maybe we can come back with that. But um, Peter, let's close this one down and bring um, uh, Jacques in and, uh, and start the second session, if that's okay with you. Yeah, no, that's absolutely, fair, absolutely great. And thank you guys so much for joining in with this. I think it's just so important, I think, to get some of this stuff talked about and out in the open. And um, yeah, no, it's, it's been absolutely fascinating. And I hope it's really uh, insightful and, and useful for people who are watching this. Um, so huge thank you. Um, 
And, and today we're having a fascinating meeting um, with, with people about basically succeeding in medcoms despite what life throws at us. Um, and we've got some individuals talking about their challenges and some professionals talking. Um, so if you're watching this video later on um, and you're watching just part of this, do go and have a look at the other videos that will be linked because the whole story together is absolutely fascinating. Um, on that note, Stephen, I'm going to hand over to you to take the lead on this session. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, it's, it's uh, again, it's uh, Katia and myself uh, chairing this. Um, if chairing is the right word, but um, it's really good that you could all join us. Jacques, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, we, we may have to change the format a little bit as Christina is dealing with a, an emergency patient at the present time, uh, but we have some questions for you. And also we have got some um, written responses to questions that we posed to uh, an independent HR consultant. Um, but uh, the first question for myself, Jack, is, is could you sort of introduce yourself? Because you have some quite interesting roles, really. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, if, if you'd be so kind. Uh, right, so I'm um, an occupational physician. Um, so that's a medical doctor who's trained in occupational medicine. Um, before that, I was a, a GP. Uh, and then specialized afterwards. Um, all through my career though, I've been interested in law and ethics as well. So I've taken um, um, degrees in that. So, and um, so my interest now is uh, especially in occupational health ethics, but I do have wide experience um, both in the NHS, in, in the private sector, um, and, uh, but I've been retired four years now, so, uh, but. I think my experience is reasonably current. Uh, hopefully I, I can help with uh, most questions that you'll have for me. Jacques, you're, you're being a little bit modest because I believe you have an academic post in Manchester and you've also written a, a book, which I'd like you to tell us about. Thank you. Yeah, I've um, written uh, a book on occupational health ethics. So it's um, uh, simply en entitled Occupational Health Ethics from Theory to Practice. So the main um, audience for that book is, is um, occupational health practitioners themselves. Um, the majority are occupational health nurses. I mean, the, the, there's only 400 special, you know, specialist occupational physicians in the UK. Um, the majority of the work is carried out by occupational health nurses. Um, and the team around them. So that would be physiotherapists, counselors, ergonomists, and so on. So we work as a team. So it's, it, it's addressed to, to their practical problems really, but with a theoretical basis in, in ethics. Uh, but it might interest others. Uh, I, I've tried to make it very readable. So I think any one of you who, with the problems that you presented today, uh, could read a few pages of, of this book and see what um, the take on occupational medicine might be. Um, yeah, so, so briefly, that's me. Did you want me to also explain what? Because one of the um, assumptions I make in the book is that people will know what occupational health or occupational medicine is. And that isn't always, um, obviously, uh, to this audience, that might not be... Um, uh, correct. So uh, occupational medicine is that branch of medicine that deals with the effects of health on work and work on health. So traditionally, um, it, it arose from industrial medicine. So we were used to, you know, the foundries and chemical, um, toxic chemicals and, and so on. So the effect of those um, agents on the health of, of workers. Um, as well as the status of your health, um, meeting some, uh, some standards, for example, uh, train drivers or um, you know, police officers and so on, they, they need to meet um, some medical standards and, and um, that is part of the assessment that we would make as well. So these are the two uh, components of um, occupational health really. And Jack, sort of, uh, you say how um, the original, the origins of this profession. What kind of range of um, people would uh, an occupational physician now see in his practice? Well, the coverage uh, of occupational health in the UK is um, 
is still a minority, really. It's not all employers offer occupational health, which is very different to Europe, for example. In many countries in Europe, uh, there's virtually 100% coverage. Um, but the, it, the need for occupational health might be the most obvious where there are um, occupational hazards, like in manufacturing. Um, and nowadays, um, well, not nowadays, but for, from, for many years now, there have been a requirement for NHS um, personnel to have at least consultant occupational um, health supervision, really. So, so the, the doctors might just work a few sessions a week. That was what I did towards the end of my career, really. I might work two or three sessions, two or three um, half days in one trust. Um, but look at um, giving advice to the occupational health nurses who would be there um, um, permanently, really, you know, full time. So, the, so there's occupational hazards in the NHS, but really when, when you think about um, any sort of industry, there are hazards. Um, and the, the most recognized one probably nowadays is stress and work-related stress. Um, and that does, you know, so from my early days of training, where sort of mental health disorders weren't considered the, 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 the large part of the curriculum, to nowadays probably 60 to 70 percent of, of all um, referrals to occupational health services would be uh, mental health based. So, um, and, and um, on that note, um, sort of stress and mental health issues, obviously incredibly common. And in, we all we're all stressed, I'm sure. Um, and mental health issues, if it affects one in three of us, one in four of us, um, what can you actually offer? Well, the, most occupational health departments will have uh, counselors, and some psycho sometimes some will have uh, psychologists as well. So, so there's the uh, immediate support for the person that might. Um, be sometimes faster than someone could access, uh, a, a patient or a worker could access by their GP, for example. But the, um, the component of uh, stress that we particularly look at is are the, um, part, the issues of stress at work, really. And there, because of our proximity to managers, the workplace, culture, um, we have a chance of um, hopefully getting to the root cause of the stress if it's arising from work. Um, one of the approaches is a stress risk assessment. And, um, and when I first started, you know, probably about 20 years ago, people said, well, um, well, on the issue of stress risk assessments, when I wrote, when I um, mentioned this to managers and so on, and they said, well, well, I mean, the, the first um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, managers didn't want to, to talk about stress. They said that, well, either they said it didn't exist, or they said, well, if we start mentioning stress, everyone's going to say they're stressed and, and, um, and you know, we won't have anyone working really. And in those early days, and that was in a, in a chemical um, manufacturing company, and actually they, they, they were uh, persuaded to start the process. And um, it was quite the opposite um, because people became very open about what um, were potential stresses. Then they start looking for solutions. And, um, and you know, people weren't of, prior to that, um, if people weren't coping, they would be presented with back pain or um, other sort of physical illnesses that, you know, but, but always hiding the real uh, root cause. But by bringing it to the open, um, you know, issues could be addressed. Jack, I mean, who are you paid by? Which leads me to the question, you know, do you represent the uh, client who comes to see you or do you represent the employer? Because my impression is, oh, oh occupational health, it's ended occupational health. It's a first step on the road to, you know, that leads to the, the out the door, really. Yeah. 
very good question. I mean, we are paid by the employee in the main. Um, even when you know NHS-based um, occupational health services might be thought of being more independent, but at the end of the day, they're still paid by the employer. Um, but the our role is meant to be completely unbiased, neither starting with the patient or the employer. Um, but it's a very difficult um, um, balance to achieve, really. And I think depending on who you see, you might see some occupational health um, physicians who are slightly more on, on the employer manager's side. And I'll, I'll um, be quite open about it that I've tended to be more on the patient side. And I make your apologies for this really because <clears throat> of the um, panelists this morning, uh, you know, in the first session, what I what struck me very much was how well supported um, they are they are in, in, by the, these employers. But I have also seen employers who are not supportive at all. And when you when you um, have workers that are the most vulnerable, I think our um, role as an as an occupational um, health professional is to be. Um, you know, to at least give them a chance to present their case and that, that sort of thing, really, to, to be the, the um, well, you know, I'd still say impartial, but at least we, you know, our role, I think, is to ensure some degree of fairness in what goes on between the, um, the work and the employer. Because when um, someone's going through the difficult times that all the panelists have, have described this morning, you know, when you're in the thick of it, and your mind isn't very clear. And if your employer is very, very negative about you, um, you you know, you might accept anything they say, you might believe anything they say and so on. And I think in those circumstances, we have to say, well, you know, firstly, that might be the wrong time to be making a decision. You're not fully, you know, you, you need to give your treatment time, you know, to see the right specialist for, for a start or get the right help, be on the right, treatment, give that a chance to work, and let's look at what um, could be adjusted, what potentially could be adjusted in the workplace, because we only give advice, and it is up to the manager to, to accept or, or um, decline, really, any sort of adjustments that we, we propose. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I'd say it could be both. Um, I would hope that the majority would at least um, you know, we're not part of a process of trying to um, get workers the talk. And very often we wouldn't know the outcome, you know, the, the, so we would give the advice as impartial as we can on the condition, what could be done and so on, and give that advice to the um, manager. And, but that might be the last we hear of it. Um, so, so yeah. Another point that I would raise to, you know, um, for those that um, I think in the um, UK, the, the way that occupational health is provided now is by large occupational health providers. And there's some dis distancing between um, the occupational health service and the workforce um, because they're not employed primarily by, the, by the, that employer. They have their own um, so, so although that, that um, gives a little bit of uh, distance between the employer and the professional, the difficulty is that the employer controls this relationship via the contracts. So if they're not happy with what they're hearing, they could easily not renew the contracts. And, um, but we, I think as professionals have to rise above this and still do the job as we think you know, it should be done. If we lose the contract, we lose the contract, and that's um, that's it. Because our prime, although I've said you know it's work on health and health at work, one of our um, key drivers is to protect the health of workers at work. That um, that is the sort of um, when there's conflict, when there are difficulties between employer and employee. That's always what um, I use as the sort of 
uh, gives me a sense of direction. You know, are we protecting the work, the health of a worker here in this situation? And this is the sort of um, direction that I've taken the, the books on ethics and so on in. And that's how, as, as you mentioned, I, I still teach. I, I um, teach at Manchester University and that's how I, um, you know, teach the students to carry on, but that's... I think, um, Jacques, in preparing for this session, uh, I, I may got the, have got the line wrong, uh, but I think you said of one enlightened employer that you were the last bastion uh, of, of, of fairness or something in the company, or words that effect. Uh, have I, uh, did I get that right, the quote? I thought it was another yeah, quote. Yeah, that, that was many years ago. And I was, um, you know, that was when I was still a, a very young doctor and I was very struck by um, one of the, you know, manufacturing companies that I was working for, the um, managing directors, because, you know, we, we, the role also included giving advice directly to higher management on policy and, and, and so on. We'd be part of um, health and safety meetings. So, so the managing director would see me in those sort of contexts really. And there would be um, advice or policy advice that I would give on based on health really. I would say, well, I think, you know, we're putting workers health at risk if we use X, Y, and Z. But for financial reasons, they might push um, for the, which, whichever processes to be used, really, you know, they were either cheap or whatever. Um, but even though we disagreed on those points, he would say, yes, Jacques, but you're the, um, you're the conscience of this organization, of, of this company. So even though we might disagree, I, I still want to hear what it is that, you know, we should be doing. He might, he might decide not to do it, but at least he's got someone telling him. That um, and I think we we are going a little bit full circle. I'm seeing more companies now wanting to get that sort of advice of what um, is how they can act to help the well-being of their workforce. I think that's starting to come back. Yeah. For, for forty years, or so I've uh, I've seen um, so many. Um, workers say the opposite of what um, many of you have said this morning, you know, because I, I was picking up on um, one or two saying how valued you felt, you know, how, how you'd been treated by the organization that made you feel valued. I would, you know, to my um, sorrow, really, I've heard so, so many nurses, for example, say how um, they feel just like. Um, you know, uh, pegs that you can just put just anywhere, you know, a, a nurse might be trained in, in a certain field and be, because of shortage of staff, they're told by the manager, no, you're on ward, whatever, you know, uh, and in a special idea that they have no, no idea. So it's so devalued, not all their training or their experience. So for many, many years, I've, this is the sort of, um, um, aspect of my work that I, I felt very um, sad at having to, to um, uh, deal with people in those situations really. But I'm, I'm starting to see that organizations have realized that if they treat their staff better, they, you know, it, it's everyone wins really. So, so Jacques, just keep a little eye on the time. Um, uh, two last things from me. Um, the, this morning we've heard from, or this afternoon we've heard from um, Lisa about her horrendous um, COVID problems. Uh, Katia obviously about issues with um, uh, with the menopause. Uh, uh, we've heard about migraines. Di David managing his diabetes, um, uh, autism. Is there anything you, as a professional, could have offered these people had they come to you? Um. I would, I would probably, in a word, I'd probably say no. Um, because I think one of the aims that we should have is to make ourselves redundant as a creation of professionals. Um, but that happens you know, in the, the experience that I've had with the employers that I've encountered in, in the main, and that hasn't happened. We've had to uh, be the voice. Um, 
yeah, suggesting the adjustment, suggesting there's the flexibility. Um, but, you know, we can only give this, this, but with employers who do value their employees, who do make the effort, who have those conversations, where there's mutual trust, I think between, you know, employee and employee workers. Um, no, very often we might add just a very little, but in my re recollection of, you know, um, probably working 35 to 40 years in the field, um, there was once when a manager referred me someone, uh, it had been with a mental health problem. And he said, well, this is what we've done. And this is, you know, the, the, flex the adjustments and, and um, the uh, gradual return to work as um, Lisa Marie had, you know, gradual phase return and so on. This is what we've agreed and this is what we've been doing. And all I had, I, there was nothing I could add. And I said, you know, this is the best um, referral I've ever had because I've, I've not had to do anything at all. I've, I've said to the manager this, you know, you've said, done absolutely everything that I could have suggested. And in many of your cases, this is what I would say um, probably would be the, um, the result really. I might, you know, depending on, on, we'd have to spend a little bit more time with each one of you because they're, there might be circumstances, you know, for example, with um, type one diabetes, if there are um, certain risk situations, like I've had nurses or um, lab workers in, in the NHS and so on, very often their problem really has been um, managers being worried about them, being um, not being able to do certain duties and so on. So, so what I would um, highlight there is the need to do an ind individual assessment. You know, so, so we might look at um, labels, diagnoses and so on, but I think several of you have already um, mentioned that there's a wide range of symptoms, a wide range of severities. And what we need to look at is in the, the individual, how does it that condition affect you really as a person? And, and everyone will have very different needs and different needs in the workplace. Um, and for the nurses, sometimes the, the managers would, well, for, sometimes I would get, you know, can, can she really, you know, can this nurse really work here in a busy a &E department, whatever, and then that sort of thing, try to, not to employ them or, or get them uh, in their department. But in, in the main, they, they've been very, very successful and all they've needed is, sometimes quick access to some snacks in the, um, uh, you know, in their, their fridge or um, ability to, to take the blood sugars when they need to um, and that sort of thing. And as um, David is mentioning, I think, you know, the, 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 the um, there's no reason for, mo for most, most diabetics for them not to be able to do the full job. Sometimes you just have to think of a few, um, minor adjustments, but, but yeah. Uh, but I think in, in, I don't have anything very specific. Yeah, like in Daniel's case, you know, with the migraine and so on, this is what we would be trying to, to negotiate with the employer, that they have some flexibility when they do have um, the problem, well, you know, can they rest, can they go in a dark place or whatever then that, that individual needs really. Could there be some flexibility in the way uh, people work? Yeah, I think the one of the advantages, I think um, it was Mark, wasn't it, that mentioned the advantages of having COVID and working from home is that that's one of the aspects of, you know, why can't people work from home when they have a particularly bad day in many jobs that, that has been possible even before. But I think COVID has shown us that this does work. I think prior managers were worried that if people aren't in the workplace, they're not going to work. But I think COVID has taught us that that's not true. No, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I think, Christina, I was trying to just log in there, but not, not a problem. Um, the um, final one here, question here from, uh, from Michael. Um, uh, uh, also, I wondered about this. So we're a small company. If one wants to find an occupational position, uh, you know, how does one do that? I mean, probably a big company like Ashfield may well have an occupational position. Uh, how does one find one if one's a, a freelancer or an individual on their own? I would suggest um, 
you check on the Society of Occupational Medicine website, SOM website, they will list um, occupational providers who are, you know, who, who they endorsed, really. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, Peter, could you just check the, the, the uh, see if Christina's just trying to, uh, I think she was trying to join us. I don't know if you can see her there. Okay, not a problem. She's not there, no. Um, Katja, anything from you, or do you want to now maybe mention about the HR advice? H I will do. Just wanted to make one comment, um, actually, from Jack. It's fascin absolutely fascinating occupational, that it's interesting that it was born out of industries which were high risk, you know, construction where you could fall and kill yourself. And uh, we're all, you know, medcoms is a desk place, desk based job, safe for all intents and purposes, but that actually doesn't reduce the, all the challenges that people have and and that some simple adjustments that can help them but just saw that I thought that was fascinating is that you know we're not in you know we don't tame lions or something like that but that doesn't mean that uh, people don't have challenges yes and I think uh, in recent years um, what you know I mentioned stress and mental health so, so the fact that you know it's spoken um, the, the, we speak more openly about uh, health conditions now. And I think you've brought the menopause. I think that's an, another large area of interest now, you know, that um, so, so your health problems are now um, highlighted more in a way because the, the uh, risks directly from the workplace, from toxins and, and um, you know, or the dangers have diminished or made them um, much safer and more more controlled. Um, so, so yeah, there are, there are fewer workers, uh, and the employer should, um, well, we hope they would value their workers more. Absolutely, Jack. That was very insightful. Uh, I never knew what occupational physicians did, so that's been very very helpful. And also, uh, as Lisa, Lisa Marie said honest of you to say where you can't help. So that, that is useful, really. Um, Katya, can I pass the baton to you? Because I think you're going to mention a couple of HR things, and it might just be that, that Jack is able to comment on a couple of them. I'm conscious about the time. Uh, perhaps, yeah. Perhaps we'll have a couple of minutes just on what... Eight, what uh, yeah, it, when it, uh, was, it was really... I think it sort of fits in quite nicely uh, in terms of if we're looking at everybody doing well in the workplace, um, and we talked about the challenges, you, you actually need uh, the right environment uh, to, to do well. And, and so that sort of touches on topics like equality, diversity and inclusion, not as buzzwords, but actually as descriptions of good working environments. And we, we have a, a friendly human resources consultant that couldn't be with us, uh, Yvette Court, but um, she, I asked her about uh, these terms. So it's very easy to use them without understanding what they mean. And she provided me with some descriptions that I thought I'd share with you. Um, she also provided some very interesting resources that I thought, uh, I don't know if we can share them at some point, it would be very good. Um, so her description about um, equality in terms of um, e equal job opportunities and fairness for all employees and applicants. And the idea that somebody mustn't be treated unfairly because of a particular characteristic, whether that's their age or religion or ethnicity um, and really linked to that is the concept of diversity so work for workplace is actually encouraging a wide range of people with different backgrounds with these different um, aspects rather than a very narrow group of people that all um, think the same um, and really valuing those differences but being set up to to monitor whether you are being diverse so she makes the point that it's not just recognizing the benefits of people with diverse backgrounds, but actually monitoring it and taking action if, it's, if that's not happening. And then the third term, inclusion, she described as really a place where everybody feels valued and they feel safe to either raise issues or make suggestions or look at different ways of working. Um, and Really, I thought that was quite interesting because when you take all three together, the equality, diversity and inclusion, I think quite often we use it when we're almost thinking about the negatives, you know, avoiding harassment, avoiding bullying, 
avoiding discrimination. But she actually had a much more positive view of it. And she really described it in terms of actually creating an environment where you attract and keep staff, you make them happy and motivated, um, you improve ideas and, and really generating problem solving. Um, but also as a business, you are able to um, deliver work to maybe a more diverse audience, uh, a bigger range of customers, um, and actually that's successful for the company. So I thought that was quite a nice way, it's only very briefly, but just to get us thinking about those terms. Um, one of the links, and uh, uh, Stephen, I don't know how we're going to do this sharing of the links, but she did um, provide some links towards um, mental health, disability and well-being. Um, the one thing that I'm really interested in is that she provided a link to the question, how and when do I disclose a disability during job applications? And I know a lot of people often worry about that. When should they say something? And it's probably too, it's one of these, it depends answers. So it's a little bit too much to go into today, but um, it's from the Open University. And I think there might be some useful tips there for people to know if they are in a situation and they're going for a new job, when do they raise some of these issues? And she's done a whole list of other things as well. So if that is something that we could share with people afterwards, and I think that would be really nice. Um, on that note, um... Rhiannon uh, in the chat um, has has suffered from an eating disorder um, and her question is exactly that you know should you be telling people um, at the interview that you have this problem uh, Jack I don't know do you have any comments on that perhaps well, if we look at the disability discrimination legislation the um, what the requirement is uh, for disclosure after you've been offered the job because that goes to the occupational health department then, and, and we would keep diagnosis confidential. We, we, don't we don't routinely tell the employer what the diagnosis is unless that's what the um, employee wants. But, but so yes, our advice would be not to disclose before you've been offered the job. That, that's really helpful, actually. That's, really, that's good to know. Um, Okay, um, uh, uh, Katya, any more on that? So, so what we're going to do, uh, so, so Daniel's um, tips about migraine, it's on the St. John's Medical um, website. Uh, there's a, there's a, sort of a, a, a kind of a posting site on their subsite called Medium, and you can see his two articles there. Um, the advice from uh, Yvette Court, um, we're also going to post uh, later on this afternoon it's almost ready to go. We'll also post that on Medium. So there are lots of useful resources on that. Um, she, she's, you know, she's very, very human, and we've, we, we, um, she's looked after us very, very well, really. Um, a couple of things from the website. Um, so um, uh, yes, so uh, comment from Mark. I thought this was incredibly be sad. sad. Um, two care workers. Uh, one minute looking after people with dementia. One minute they're they're praised and the best things are sliced bread. The next the next minute they are. It's a bit like they're clapping for the NHS. The next minute they're being criticised. That's just a sad reflection. And um, we still have this business, um, uh, Lisa Marie, that we're going to hopefully touch on about uh, difference between COVID and other chronic diseases. Um, we could possibly mention that. Um, and also. Practical advice about menopause. You're going to pick that up, Katya, I think, um, individually. Uh, uh, Lisa Marie, do you want to say anything quickly about the difference between COVID and other chronic diseases? Or quickly, um, <laughs> the only thing with with COVID and post COVID, it's still so new. Every and same mm -hmm. like every chronic every chronic disease as well is different to every single every single person. The only thing I will say is different is. Whereas it's very similar, some of my personal experience is very similar to ME, however, alongside it as well, with um, really bad lungs, can't, my heart rate going mental, it's just trying to find the, the box, that, the correct box that I fit in of how, how to find the right help. It's a really hard question and one I genuinely have been sat thinking about for about an hour and I still can't think of the right answer to it because I don't think there is one, it's just all very new there's so many different ailments within it i think it's like 55 one thing about like 55 long-term effects have been with long covid 55 are the main um 
issues or ailments that people find 55 and that's after 12 weeks of having COVID and this it's just still so new to be able to answer that question but I, I assure you tomorrow I'm going to think about that really hard and I will come back to you because I don't know the answer right now in all honesty. Um, thank you so much for that. Katya I think we're, we're done we need to hand back. Yes. Um, are, are there any final comments or anything quick that anyone else wants to say? A great session Jack really. Brilliant. I just want to say thank you for listening and thank you for the opportunity to put my story across. Inspiring. Fantastic. Peter, it's back again, to you. shall I jump back in? I mean, again, guys, absolutely fascinating listening to you. And I hope we are uh, inspiring people to have these conversations within their own organizations. And, yeah. and I think that, that several of you have talked about the importance of being openness, uh, of being open and talking to people. And, and, um, and the fact that being open isn't necessarily a negative because you can find solutions, you can, um, you know, find better ways of working and so on. I think we've touched on the whole COVID thing. Um, you know, there's benefits in terms of flexible working. Um, I, I think there's probably, you know, issues that still need to, in challenges that are raised, but um, more flexibility, more transparency, more openness, more diversity, more, you know, sort of leads to more successful business and, and more successful individuals. I think that's, that's all good stuff, but there was a ton of stuff in there. Um, and we could have gone on for much, far longer um, in, yeah. in lots of different directions. And I'm well aware of that. So I hope, if nothing else, we've just started some really interesting conversation, got some people thinking. So, and it's really worth, it's been fascinating to hear the stories from individuals, from professionals, and now from the HR experts. So a um, huge thank you to Sharon and Karen for joining us. I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourself first, your company, yourself. And then we're going to spend half an hour just talking about, um, from your perspective, how do you support your staff um, and, and balancing supporting staff and wanting everyone to be happy with, frankly, making the business work, okay, which is the dilemma, I guess, at the heart of this. So, uh, Karen, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself first. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Karen Alderson. I work at Amiculum. I've been with Amiculum about two and a half years now, but I was working at another Medcoms agency before that. So I've been in Medcoms for about 11 years now. Um, as well as my role in, in medical communications, I'm a mum to two primary school age children. So I can speak personally to some of the parenting challenges that have come with the pandemic, um, as well as the kind of challenges and, and the opportunities we've sort of faced as an employer. And I think it's been really useful if you listen to some of the other, um, the panels that have been on today, it, it's, it's useful to highlight that there have been some significant challenges over the last couple of years, but there have been some gains as well in terms of how we work, how we communicate, how we develop people and work together as a team. So I think it would be useful to highlight, highlight some of that as well. So um, if I just tell you a bit about Amiculin, we are an independent healthcare communications uh, company. We've got 11 agencies and over 300 team members across 13 different uh, locations globally. So as you can imagine, we have teams ranging in size, in lots of different locations, different time zones, all with different situations. And that's been uh, really interesting to, to, to handle and work with over the last two years, different sort of stages of the pandemic happening at different times across the world. So, um, so yeah, that's all kind of come into uh, the last couple of years. So it's been non-stop really for HR, as I'm sure it will be when Sharon <laughs> talks about her situation and um, supporting managers and teams, adapting, flexing lots of processes and procedures, and developing training materials, lots of communication, lots and lots of listening. Um, and if that's something I can get across as much as possible today, it's about listening to people and their individual needs, um, making sure we can respond to those um, so we can kind of overcome any challenges, but also retain some of the more positive changes that, that might have happened as a result of what's kind of impacted um, everybody. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I would say that, you know, We've heard so much today. We've heard people with lots of different health needs. We have people with different personal situations and people with things going on outside of work isn't a new thing. Um, it's always been the case. People have caring responsibilities, families, um, health stuff, other things going outside of work that um, maybe an awareness of these sorts of things have been has been raised slightly. There's been a bit of a raising of 
and say in some situations because everybody's found it difficult in one way or another um, but it's not a new thing um, and people are individuals that it's really important to see them as a whole person as an individual and, and communication and, and creating that environment of safety and, and support and trust where people can raise any concerns or questions they have and, and knowing they can do so without without judgment and that they will get the support they need so yeah opening open questioning listening skills um individuals the employees are usually the biggest expert in themselves on what they need so you know let's listen to them and, and do what we can i guess that's my you know, take Okay, thank you very much, Karen. We'll, we'll explore a bit more of that in more detail in a moment. But Sharon, would you like to introduce your, yourself and Oxford Pharmagenesis? Yes, so Sharon Frost, I'm the Global HR Director at Oxford Pharmagenesis, and I joined just over two years ago. So I do kind of consider myself a bit of a COVID joiner. Um, I literally was in the business for a couple of months before, well, about three months, I think, before um, we all then decided to, to work from home a couple of weeks before um, we were mandated to. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, I concur with much of what Karen just said there. We have, we have seven offices with people attached to them. We have eight official offices in our business. Um, we also have a situation as a result of COVID where we have, you know, an individual working in Poland now, other people working out of New Zealand. So people moved either temporarily or permanently as a result of um, COVID. And I think, you know, one of the comments that, that Karen made there that, that I agree with wholeheartedly is, you know, we're now looking at the whole person, not just the person that presents themselves at work and making whatever we can work in a reasonable way happen um, so that we are able to retain our key talent. We're all fishing in a very small pond for exceptionally talented individuals. Um, and we've seen some real benefits from the COVID situation in terms of you know, looking at people as true individuals and being able to consider that, that whole person. And I think um, for me, the word that was almost applicable to every story was trust. You know, if you don't have that trusting relationship, are you going to tell someone that you have this condition that may require you to, you know, have, you know, breaks from meetings or, you know, just adapt the way that you work from um, the, what was a standard, you know, you come to work at nine and you finish at half past five and you have an hour lunch break, et cetera. That was, that, that was certainly in 20 odd years of working the way that I had spent the vast majority of my my time working and I think now we're able to really think about what is the art of the possible for us working with each other rather than one person working for somebody else and I think that's been a real benefit um, you know of course there's some horror stories and we've heard you know one or two today but I think where we can capture the positives and then take that on board for our future um, because I can see some real you know unknowns um, being real positives that, that ne were never imaginable um, happening as a result of the way that we as employers are now thinking so more positively and differently um, for that working with each other and being together um, rather than any kind of hierarchical um, relationship that, that certainly existed when I started in, in, <laughs> in my world of work 20 odd years ago. Okay. Okay. So look, we're going to have a freewheeling discussion here, and um, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and provoke some some interesting uh, comments here. Okay, uh, kick me back if I go a little bit too far. That's fine. Um, but uh, audience members, you also join in here and um, and I'll ask some questions using the chat boxes. Okay. Um, just wanted to put an observation. Maybe it's an observation more than the question out. Um, and some context here, because I'm not quite sure who's watching this or whatever, okay. Um, I've been running Medcoms Networking for 15 years. We're in a very different place. The Medcoms business is very different now than it was 15 years ago. Um, agencies like yours have grown very rapidly and are much larger um, by definition. But you know what I mean? The, 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 the whole business though has matured. And I, I found that absolutely fascinating to watch. Um, so we are in a very different position. But your two agencies in particular have grown a lot in the last few years really yeah um but it's but but i suppose what i want to say is in medcoms generally there's a huge variety um, of agency types sizes very small agencies very large agencies um, let's just make the point i think we should make the point you two are both quite large fast growing independent agencies yeah um and 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 we're going to talk 
about your sort of environment. And I just think it's worth making that point because there are going to be differences if you're a, a, a 10, 20, 30 person small startup sort of agency or boutique agency, or you're a big global group of communications companies. So I think we just need, and, and I'm going to say, frankly, mm. I did try to get with a panel like this, I try and get diversity on a panel, all right? Um, and unfortunately, Andrew wasn't with us. So that's a slightly different sort of an agency. But actually, you've got a limited number of seats at the panel, as it were. I try and go for diversity. But in some ways, you are two quite similar, in some ways, agency types. Um, I also did try to get a chap on this panel and failed dismally. So I was, <laughs> I'm partly just that, covering yeah. myself. <laughs> well, exactly. So, but, but, uh, in HR, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think all I'm saying is, as we have this conversation, that I think people watching it should think about the fact that we are going to be talking about a certain sort of agency type environment by definition, although we have observations on, on others, okay. So my question actually to both of you, bearing around all of that, I hope I haven't rambled too long, but if you were sitting looking at either of your agencies five years ago, what sort of HR function was there? And, I, and I, I'm looking for some honesty here. I mean, you, well, I'm going to put words in your mouth, but you know, and how, what's happened over the last five years and particularly in the last couple of years from an HR function point of view, because certainly 10, 15 years ago, you wouldn't have found many HR people really in medcoms. They were starting to appear, but they were more about talent acquisition and, and, and there were people looking after people, but HR has boomed within medcoms. I, Try and help me help me put some context on this because I don't want to sort of say the wrong thing or put, or, or, or put words in your mouth. I, I'm going to go with Sharon first. All right, I just want a reflection, if you can. The the see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I've only been in medcoms for two years, so we will probably give quite different responses, Karen and I, because obviously she's been in medcoms much longer. But if I look at what HR looked like 15 years ago, it was called the HR department, and it was full of HR people. Um, HR at Oxford Pharmagenesis, since I joined, has changed dramatically. Um, so I joined two years ago and had a team of seven reporting into me, and we're more than three times that now, because what we have done is invested in the function that is investing and supporting our people. And I kind of work on a basis of divide to conquer. So we don't just have a talent acquisition department. We have a very large learning and development function as well. We have a function that looks after engagement and reward and recognition too. Um, and then we have our HR specialists. And we also are really connected with other groups, colleague groups within the business. So we have um, leadership management teams, we have um, employee forums, charity committees, mental health first aiders, EDI advocates and all of these groups we're working with because they are representative of certain groups, as well as obviously doing kind of engagement surveys for um, the mass to be able to sort of give their feedback in a, an anonymous way as well. Um, I think Oxford Pharmagenesis, I've only worked in Oxford Pharmagenesis in Medcoms, a real strength is that we still have many of the global leadership team, our executive team, who have been in the business for a very long time. So our, you know, our chairman who founded the business is still very active and our CEO and COO have been in the business for a very long time. So they, they really connected to when it was 20 or 50 people. And as we're growing, we've nearly doubled in the two years I've been in the business. Um, as we're growing, they're really helping us as an HR function, keep true to what we were about when we were that really small family feel business. And I think we're really working hard on maintaining that as, as, as you know, our DNA really and the heart of the, the heartbeat of our business. So, so we've got this quite um, interesting, from an HR point of view, interesting dynamic at play that really means that, that we need to invest in the HR department in order to really support our people to, to feel you know that intention that that our, our founder and CEO and COO have. Okay, and Karen, you 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 have been in Medcoms a while longer, and and you can compare and contrast a couple of different, yeah. very different sort of agency environments. So again, same basic question to you, but talk more generally about this sort of you know development of HR within Medcoms over the last few years. Yeah, and um, no, I, I would see a lot more similarities across Medcoms agencies than differences actually having worked in a couple of there are differences certainly the differences in structures and sizes and 
you know, policies and procedures. Um, but certainly in terms of the way people you know, are treated and managed and things like this, you can see a lot of similarities. The industry drives probably how we work and what, what how we need to work with people. Um, I think in terms of the development of HR, it's, it's not a dissimilar answer to what Sharon said. It's it, it's grown and developed according to the, the growing and developing needs. So for example, we, we do have, we have a careers team that focuses mainly on recruitment and, and kind of um, career opportunities for people coming into the business. And we have curriculum, our learning, learning team, our learning platform, um, and they are technically separate teams, but we all work together very closely. So HR kind of links in and works really closely with them, those two teams, and um, as Sharon said, with the leadership team. And what you do find it with, with a fast growing business is um, that you, know, you have to focus on the elements that retain that culture and the strength that, that you had at the start of it. So, and, and that's comes through um, good communication, developing leaders and managers, because those people, the founders, they're not able to then be in contact with everybody as they would have done maybe 10 years ago, where they you know, basically sort of indirectly managed everybody in the business. And that's not, that's not possible when you get to 300 plus people and everybody's spread out. So um, I think probably what you were talking about is that HR maybe 10, 15 years ago is quite um, transactional, um, a lot about process, about, about kind of organisational, operational aspects of, of employment, and that has grown and developed into um, areas about people development, career planning, career development, um, recruitment, certainly talent acquisition is a huge part of the business um, because of the market we're in and, and how highly competitive it is. And that all has to link together as well. So if you're talking to candidates and talking about the business and what the culture is like and, and trying to attract people, then that's got to feed through and, and align with what you're creating as people come into the business as well and the experiences they're ha having. So, yeah, it's all kind of interconnected and, and um, you know, kind of, um, yeah, aligned across, okay. across the business. So, blunt question, do you think you have to be a certain size of agency before you have an HR function, meaningful HR function. Is there a reflection of size in that? Because it's quite a big investment, isn't it? You start up a new little agency, do you start by investing in the HR and the learning development and the training and all stuff? Or do you just find some people who can get on with the job and, and get it done? So I, I just wonder, I'm trying to be slightly sort of flippant about it, but I just wonder whether you've got any views on, on that. Anybody? <laughs> I think it probably depends on, I mean. yeah, it probably depends on who's in the business and what, you know, as soon as you have a business, you have people in the business and you employ them, you have needs to provide for them. So there are employment needs, there are welfare issues, there are, um, you know, en engagement concerns and, and um, career development, learning and development, situ you know, things that they need. So all of that exists with or without a HR department. And I guess it's just a choice from business owners as to when they have somebody who's a specialist in that or whether they have people within the business that, that can manage all of that. But it all needs to be there, I think, it would be my answer. Okay, and same from you, Sharon, you're nodding away. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, it's about responding to the situation that you're in. There can be, you could have one agency that's 50 people that's quite happy to not have an HR function because you know, it's quite tactical operation, etc. You can have another that has got, you know, really ambitious individuals that in order to retain them, you're going to need to constantly be kind of growing them for them to thrive and, you know, and reach their potential. And therefore, some of these other things like reward and engagement and, and L&D are going to be far more important in that environment. So I think it it's one of those it depends answers. Yeah. And, and I think you both touched on the fact that in, a, in an environment like we're in with Medcoms, where it's... Um, you're growing very fast the whole business is growing very fast and trying to recruit people um, and there are limited numbers of people out there um you know and you're all sort of fighting over sort of experienced people that things like the, the the if i can call it the hr support to individuals by which i'm encompassing all the learning and development the training the coaching the mentoring everything else becomes a a really important factor that new recruits will look at 
I guess we're just going to agree with that. that that's clearly an important part of it. Right, and and, yeah, and in yeah. an environment like ours, where where you are screaming out for people, it becomes very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's where it's important that the, 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 ex, the lived experience matches what, what the, uh, you know, in our case, the careers team are, are talking to people and hiring managers are talking to people about so that they come in and they experience what they, what they have been expecting from that, through the process. Okay, so sticking with your, and I know I, I do feel we're talking about your environments here, but that's, that's fine. We've already put the context on that. So in light of, particularly in light of some of what we've heard today, and we, I mean, we all know, I mean, I grew up in an environment where, you know, we all knew we had our problems at home or we had stuff to deal with. But to be frank, we didn't, you know, and we weren't encouraged to talk about it. Um, you know, you get on with it. If you need to take a day off, then please don't. But if you have to go and take a day off and deal with it. Um, just talk a little bit around, and particularly what I'm interested in the last year or two, is how much more open this has become. Um, you know, how and how much support do you find you're giving managers and and people in the organization. I'm, I'm looking at it more from the point of view, not your lived experience. I'm looking at it from the point of view of you running a business, you managing a business, where you're providing the support to people who are providing support to the people. Do you see what I mean? How, how much effort goes into that? How much resource goes into that? You know, one of the things I was told very early on in the pandemic, or, or it was observed, was that the managers, the spotlight is on the managers. Because it's, you know, it's one thing to see someone sitting in the corner of an office and go, they don't look so happy, so I'll sidle over and have a chat and whatever. It's a completely different issue if you're managing from afar. And I think that was a, that was a really important point that they made. So I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, how much you're supporting people to support people. That makes sense. Uh, and I'm going to go with um, Karen first. Sorry, I should have. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just waiting here, nodding at each other. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, um, I think the answer is a lot, actually. Uh, it is, you know, a manager's role, a line manager's role is incredibly important and it is, it, it can be a tough role. Um, it's, you know, uh, there, there are lots of different pressures and lots of different responsibilities in that. I think, um, I, I think we have supported people, uh, managers, in supporting their team members quite a lot, and it has increased certainly through the pandemic. There's been an increase in people um, having personal challenges as a result of that. Um, but there's been, um, you know, I do think that that awareness raising has been a good thing. So people being more open and being more uh, comfortable with discussing those because as you've as I've been mentioned several times in the earlier panels if you don't know what the problem is you can't do anything to try and help it you can't can't resolve it and um, whilst it's not you know, if somebody has a personal issue whether that be a health situation um, family problems it's not their company's responsibility to resolve that issue that's certainly down to them to resolve it but anything that we can do to provide flexibility support and you know, just listening ear just to know about it so that you aren't carrying the burden and trying to sort of muddle along with your issue and your work and everything at the same time all of that can go to helping that person and ultimately then that can mean they're they're more engaged and productive at work so it, it's not just a um, you know a kindness to people um although you know that 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 is an element of it but it is you know it reflects back in the business it means people are more productive it means we can all work better as a team so um, so I, th I think the fact that those issues have been raised more frequently, people are more vulnerable with each other. They're, you know, you're kind of coming into each other's homes, aren't you, and, and bringing your life to work um, a lot more. So, yes, we've had um, more managers coming and saying, right, I don't know what to do now. Somebody's got this issue. Can you help me with it? Um, and it's about providing that listening, hearing what they've got to say, providing support where you can, and also perhaps saying, I don't know how to support this. So um, in the case of um, mental health, for example, none of us in HR are mental health professionals. There is a, there's, there's a limit to where we can support with those situations. And the same goes for line managers. Um, and it's about making sure that it's an environment where people feel comfortable having the conversations and being able to ask the questions and um, talk about things without needing to know all the answers. And being able then to, be, to, to signpost to other services, whether that service is provided by the company, you know, employee assistance programmes and occupational health type schemes that, that um, a lot of companies have and we have. Um, and where, you know, where you can kind of integrate those things. So 
I don't know if that answers the question because I can't even remember no, what the question was. Don't Peter. worry, don't I've worry. Gone off on a tangent myself. there. Don't worry, I'm forgotten <laughs> myself. But I think it's just interesting listening to you talk, and I, I, I do find it interesting just talking about this stuff because it's making us all think in our and then relating it to our own circumstances and so on. Um, but it was it was about the trade. It was it was it was it, what I was trying to get at was, and it's been picked up. I think Helen was it was at Helen was talking about you know with, with the flexible working and home working. You know how much more important is HR? And it's that what I was trying to get at was how much effort and resource you have to put into trade is supporting the people like the managers on who have to support the people who've got these problems and uh, that's what I was trying and, and, and you did that's what I was trying to get at that was the root of the question but Sharon have you you were nodding away again there I mean would yeah. you say anything different to that <laughs> oh I mean I, I agree with everything that Karen said I think just to kind of further embellish it I think we, we have we have done a few quite tactical things as well. So we we already had, I joined Oxford Pharmagenesis with a good number of mental health first aid as trained individuals. And we now probably have about a one to 20 ratio. Um, so we've really kind of upped that. And I think that is also been employee led, but they see a real value in being able to support each other. We also had and, and really make an effort to buddy every new starter with someone so they can ask those more incidental questions as well and we're about to embark on things like mentoring and also coaching for line managers to really equip people with those vital skills to be able to help each other think outside of the box and not be kind of oh, what does the rule book say but actually make sure that they're Kind of using their own discretion and treating people as individuals and knowing that they're supported behind the scenes by us in order to do that we also launched um you know a very sort of tactical thing we launched a new intranet and there's a whole section called my well-being for example and um packed with resources and we try intermittently to have sort of topics meetings to identify and you know, really signpost people to those resources on an individual basis but I think it has been a bit of a baptism of fire because you know LMD for example training was come to a, a big meeting room and we'll deliver some training to you and all of the way that we've provided support in HR has had to change you know and um and the way it's so it's not just what people are doing and where people are working, but it's how they they are working now. And, you know, and, and having those conversations to concur with Karen around, you know, don't just ask someone if they're OK. And then on Teams, it's really easy to smile and go, yes, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, ask them three times, you know, yeah. ask them a question. Really, you're not spying, you're not prying. You want them to know you've got your arm around them you've got their back and if they aren't right you are still able to help them and support them even though it's through sort of technology because it's really yeah, yeah. Easy to put on a show for the 30 minutes you've got a one-to-one -one with your line manager and and that get missed and I think you know um I, I also feel that the, the one of the positives is that people are you know the situation hit us so hard so immediately like a tsunami that actually people did have to say well, I've got I've got a six year old. How am I going to, you know, they're at home. How am I going to do today? <laughs> yeah. How am I going to organise myself? And so those conversations did, you know, did did come out early come on. Come out in the open. Yeah. 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 yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and I think that's for the good. And, and I think there'll be much more of that now. I mean, that was probably going to happen with Generation Z joining the workforce. Yeah. It's actually applying to everybody. And, 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 and I think that's a good thing. You know, we. Yeah. we we, when we can remember going on an aeroplane, the first thing they tell us is self-care, put your own mask on first. We, we often have forgotten that in the workplace. And I think COVID has helped us remember we do need to think about ourselves a little bit. So even so being overly simplistic here, if we went back to what it used to be, the old normal, which I don't think we will, you know what I mean? But sort of, but, but some of this, this is the stuff we want to hang on to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Because these I techniques, think this thinking, yeah, applies, yeah. whatever. So yeah. Go on, Karen, sorry. I think you mentioned a few things there that I thought were really helpful as well, like the, the sharing of resources and information and the communication. So, um, you know, we've got a list learning platform, but also we have a Yammer, Yammer uh, system as well. And that we, there were more uh, more channels set up in Yammer as a re result of the pandemic that have continued. So there's social channels where people are connecting. And um, I know during the pandemic, there was a great one that was actually set up by one of our leaders called homeschooling resources and people who were homeschooling would just throw ideas. I've been doing this today. This is what, you know, here's the result of my children. Try it yourself and just giving each other tips. And it, it kind of created a sense of community 
um, you know, and um, kept everybody connected. But it also, I thought it was a very, very clear message to say, we know that you have stuff going on at home and we don't expect you to be 100% able to work in the same way that you usually do. So it kind of gave you that comfort that um, it's not lip service. Oh, don't, you know, just do what you can, do what you can. It was actually, actually, you know, really, we understand that you've got these things going on. Obviously, okay. parenting and homeschooling wasn't the only challenge. There's lots of other things, but that was just one example where I think, you know, those connections have been created and the continuance of that is important. Just out of interest, uh, and again, I've always got one eye on this because a lot of what I do is trying to attract people into the business. Um, so they've got no experience by definition, they're entry level, probably younger and so on. Do you see any ch particular challenges? Maybe that's the right way to put it. Any particular challenges with bringing people in as opposed and, and supporting them as opposed to supporting the more experienced people who sort of know what they're doing? Do, again, do you just talk for a minute or two around that sort of issue? Karen, I'll start with you, but you see what I'm getting at there. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's different for different people. And it was it was great that um, Katia talked about menopause. That's something that we've highlighted recently as well and provided advice and support to, for, you know, for team members and managers. But, you know, other end of perhaps the, the kind of age range, uh, younger people will have different needs and, and certainly, um, you know, homeworking, um, isolation from colleagues, not being in an office is, seems to have been anecdotally a, a bigger issue for um, newer people into their careers who maybe can have benefited or, or want to have more social interactions with people or perhaps a home situation didn't lend itself particularly well to working from home maybe in a shared flat um you know and and not having the kind of right setup for working from home so i think you know and then middle people like me who have young children and have had you know some challenges with that so everybody's an individual everybody has different needs and i think it's just about finding what's going to work to support each person to get the best out of them and make them feel the most encouraged and, and engaged and you know, until recently um people who were finding it difficult from home were able to go and work in safely in an office if they needed to um, you know with covid secure procedures in offices um obviously it all depends on what's going on and what, what the guidelines are from governments and in all different locations you've got to keep mm -hmm. on top of that so they're changing constantly but where we can just providing different you know we can have resources that people can access when when they need them in terms of advice and support but we can also provide flexibility it might be about providing a mentor it might be about you know all, all sorts of different things so it's that very individualized um, communication and support that I think is really effective. Must have been interesting to see the sort of the, the, the waves around the world in different offices. You know, it's all very well having a policy, but in our country yeah. now, the rules have changed. Sharon, the same question though to you in terms of the, 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 the entry level. I mean, do you see particular challenges with them? Yeah, I think there's been a couple. For an entry level person joining, you know, they may have chosen to, you know, go to London and, 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 you know, have a bit of a London life and then COVID happened. And so they actually are in a bedroom and they're not going out and experiencing London. So we've had a number of people that have then reverted back to living with their parents up in Yorkshire or where, wherever, you know, and, and, and had to recognise that that would be something that might support them better than them being trapped in a room in a stranger's house and not being able to go out and, and have the experience that they they'd signed up to beyond the work. I think also helping people understand where the office is and what it is and, you know, opening it up to those people that, you know, even if it was just to go and have a look, not that you need to go to the office to work because you're in a, a bedroom in a house, but actually because you've never worked in an office and people are talking about the office, but you don't know where the loo is or, you know, where, where the meeting rooms are, et cetera. And so just being able to visualise your workspace when people are then talking about it helps you connect with them as well. The bigger issue, I think, was around onboarding new recruits that haven't had that experience and line man supporting line managers with how to onboard and train and you know giving and receiving feedback through teams is very different from sharing the air and being in the same room as someone and just being able to help them adapt 
and also explain to that new recruit that this is different for me too. We wouldn't normally be taking three hours to go through this. We'd normally sit in a room and probably do it in 30 minutes, but it's going to take longer because we're having to do it differently. And so I'm kind of learning with you or I'm having to adapt and do it different, not because of anything connected to you, just because of the situation in which we're in. And so it has been more difficult for everyone in that respect, I think. And then still trying to manage the career aspirations of obviously early on, people are promoted in medcoms quite quickly. And so still trying to meet that ambition because it doesn't disappear just because COVID's happening. And so, you know, managing everything so that we set people up for success, I think has been a real driving, you know, but okay. having conversation has been important. Again, I'm mindful of time and we're going to wrap this up in the next minute or two. But again, absolutely fascinating. We could go in lots of different directions here. But we picked up or one of the comments made in the previous sessions, particularly listening to the sort of the individuals, as it were, was how important it is to be open and to talk. You know, I mean, I guess from I suppose what I'm asked, you're just going to nod at me. But, you know, from your point of view, the message is if you've got problems, talk about it problems, you know, in the widest context. I, I guess it's as simple as that. If you hide it, then we can't help you sort of thing. Yeah, I saw a great infographic on LinkedIn this morning that was actually talking about equity rather than equality. And it was an image of four people with the same size bike um, and then the four people again, but with the disabled adjusted bike. Yeah. With the, the man had the same bike as the top image. And the woman had a slightly smaller one and the child had a miniature bike kind of thing. And I think it's about people knowing that we where we can adapt to you as an individual, we will. You know, it, you know, ask because it might be possible. And 20 years ago, people didn't ask. And I, you know, I really encourage people to ask because I think, you know, we all want to, all of us, wherever you are in your career, want to continue to grow and thrive and, and perform because you all feel like you're part of something. You know, we work okay. with each other, as I said at the beginning, not for. And okay. uh, so okay. getting that message across, I think, is vital particularly to entry-level people. Okay. And, and Karen, just to wrap this up, I mean, as a logical extension of that, we are looking at a much more diverse workforce. I mean, you know, I'm trying to be, I'm oversimplifying a massive topic, but, you know, is that just a fair comment? You know, this is a, a rapidly growing business and we're embracing different ways of working and that is going to lead, as Knight does today, to a much, much more diverse workforce. Is that is that a simple but appropriate headline okay. to jump? Yeah, I mean, it will certainly lead to, lead to more diversity, but there are things that you can do to promote that further, I think. I think, you know, obviously, bigger workforce, bound to be more uh, diversity of people within it, but that doesn't, it doesn't follow exactly in that way. So I think, you know, having open policy, it was interesting, okay. somebody mentioned earlier about, you know, oh, when should I mention my disability? Well, actually, if you ask without... In, certain, in terms of saying, do you need any adjustments at your interview? Do you need any support to attend this interview? Can, you know, kind of open the door, but it isn't saying you must tell me about any of these, any disabilities right. that you have in order to progress with this interview. So it's, you know, it's the, it's the way that you ask and the way that you communicate. And I do, yeah, just to make one last point, I think, yes, be open, um, talk about what your needs are, but it's about creating, organisations creating the environment where that, feels comfortable and you know that we are open and non-judgmental and accepting of those questions and those comments as well so if people aren't just going to come in and go oh I'll just tell you everything if, if they yeah. don't feel uh, comfortable to do so okay 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 so look guys there's so much more we could talk about but I am going to draw a line there um, and say a huge thank you to you two for joining in and talking so thank openly. Uh, thanks to the audience for joining in. Um, if anybody's got any, I'm sure you're very happy for me to say, you know, people can contact you via LinkedIn yeah, and, sure. and, and so on. Yeah. Part of the point of these webinars is to get people connecting with each other. So thank you so much for joining. The audience, thank you for joining in. Um, I'm going to wrap up the recording now just with a, a quick goodbye. If anyone's interested in what we're doing, go to medcomsnetworking.com and you'll find lots of information, resources about the Medcoms business. So quick wave, guys, and we'll stop the recording there. Thank you very much.